right. Welcome, everyone. Nikwich, merci beaucoup. Thank you for joining us this evening for our second Health Sciences webinar. This one entitled Virtual Healthcare Tools for Enhancing Your Practice to Support Patient Centered, Culturally Sensitive Healthcare. The webinar this evening is going to be delivered by Lynn Knuthia, Brittany Hanna, and Rebecca Swick from the Ontario Telemedicine Network, or OTN. I'm Dr. Michael Ravnick. I'm the manager of the Health Sciences Program at NOSM, and I'm going to do some quick welcomes and introductions before we get started. So uh, a quick agenda. Uh, we're going to have those welcomes and introductions, and then the webinar itself will be uh, about 40 minutes, and then we're going to have a moderated Q&A period. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please make sure that you put those in the chat, and our moderator will make sure that those questions get to the uh, presenters. And then uh, towards the end of that, uh, we'll have some closing remarks. And this is a reminder. Uh, about your camera and microphone, if you could please uh, make sure that those stay off for the duration of the webinar. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and is going to be posted to YouTube and available on our NOSM Rehab Science and NOTA websites within the next couple of weeks. Our first webinar that we had in September is now posted and available for you to view if you didn't have a chance to attend. So we'll start with the land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that the entirety of NASM's wider campus of Northern Ontario is the ancestral traditional lands of the First Nations people and Métis people who resided alongside. We also respectively, respectively acknowledge that the medical school building at the Laurentian University campus is located in the Robinson-Huron Treaty Territory and at the Lakehead University campus in the Robinson Superior Treaty Territory. These webinars uh, will occur monthly, and we have all of the events scheduled now through actually until the end of January 2021, and we're going to be looking to you for ideas for future monthly topics, and you'll be able to contribute ideas for those um, future webinars in our evaluation form that will be sent out towards the end of the webinar today. Our SVPs are generally going to be at the beginning of each month when the webinar is going to be held and some ideas or some examples of future topics include the virtual supervision of students, francophone health, active offer in healthcare, in, uh, indigenous traditional perspectives on pain management and indigenous traditional perspectives on mental health, just to name a few. And if you don't already receive email updates related to health sciences news at NOSM, including our webinars and placement requests, please make sure that you contact hsplacements at nosm.ca and we will make sure that you get signed up for the right email list, whether that's for rehab, NOTIP, or the physician assistant program. So, as was mentioned, we have three speakers tonight, and the first, first speaker is Lynn Canusia, and Lynn is the engagement lead at OT. And in this position, Lynn works with healthcare organizations to expand the use of virtual solutions to improve access to care. Lynn has worked in the virtual care space for over a decade, implementing innovative solutions to ensure patients are receiving the care they need when and where they want it. Lynn is a native of Northern Ontario, having lived in Sudbury for over 20 years before recently moving back to her hometown of North Bay. Our second speaker is Rebecca Swick. Uh, since 2019, Rebecca has been the Indigenous Communities Lead at OTN, supporting all Indigenous virtual care in Ontario. Previously, Rebecca started with OTN Thunder Bay in 2015 with the Remote Patient Monitoring Program, Telehome Care, in the Northwest region, working with communities from Pick River through Kenora. In 2016, she transitioned to a regional account manager position, supporting virtual care access in the Champlain, Eastern Ontario region. Rebecca has lived and worked with Indigenous communities with chronic disease health management education, youth mental health, and now virtual care for many years. And Brittany Hanna. 
Since 2019, Brittany has been the provincial lead, French language services at OTN, supporting the provincial growth of access and awareness to French language health services in Ontario. Brittany started working with OTN in 2013 in the clinical scheduling team, working to support physician offices to implement scheduling best practices. In 2017, she transitioned to the adoption account manager position, supporting virtual care access for primary care and specialist offices in Eastern and Central Ontario. Brittany is bilingual, having been raised in Timmins and completed her post-secondary studies in French. She has worked with the Francophone community for many years and understands the importance of accessing healthcare services in your preferred official language. Mikwich, merci beaucoup. Thank you, Lynn, Rebecca, and Brittany for your time today. And I'm now gonna turn things over to you. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, so I'm just gonna share our presentation. So again, my name is Lynn Knuthia. Uh, and I'm the engagement lead in the Northeast. Mike, if you can just let me know when you can see my deck. We're good, perfect. Um, so as Mike said, we're gonna be talking about virtual healthcare. I'm gonna start and give an overview of um, virtual care. And then Rebecca will talk about indigenous services and Brittany will talk about French language services. So we've already covered the learning objectives and thank you, Mike, for doing the land acknowledgement as well. Um, so briefly, so we're gonna recognize the business needs for and benefits of virtual care in Ontario, demonstrate an understanding of the Ontario Telemedicine Network and other virtual care products and tools, identify and implement virtual care workflows and protocols and understand the process for performing virtual care clinical sessions. So the first thing is, for those who may or may not be aware, OTN is now part of Ontario Health. Um, and Ontario Health vision is as follows, that every Ontarian has access to the best health care when and where they need it. And our mission as part of Ontario Health is partnering to inspire and accelerate virtual care solutions that better connect people and care across the healthcare system. So virtual care. So if I had asked this group a year ago, have you ever done a video visit? I probably maybe 25% would have done one in the past. My guess now is that everyone has done some type of virtual care uh, thanks to COVID-19. So, but what we found with the pandemic, it was a massive disruption for healthcare and society. Virtual and online delivery of services is now both expected and likely life-saving. Now that we have a virtual care system, we need to marry it with our fundamental goal. So again, for those who are familiar with the quadruple aim, so improve patient outcomes, patient experience, lower cost, and provider experience. Um, so that we're gonna talk a bit about that today, uh, but yeah, everyone was kind of thrown into virtual care and now we want to ensure that you're not only using it, but using it effectively into the best uh, of your abilities. So what is virtual care? What do we mean when we talk about virtual care? So a lot of people think of digital health. So digital health is different. When we talk about digital health, we're talking about electronic medical records, scheduling solutions, uh, databases and reporting tools, information resources. That is digital health. Virtual care refers to any activity between patients and or members of the circle of care occurring remotely using a digital health solution with the aim of facilitating or maximizing the quality and effectiveness of patient care. So some examples of this are e-consult, which we're gonna talk about briefly, remote care management, and digital self-care. A subcategory of virtual care is virtual visits, which refers to a digital interaction where one or more clinician delivers virtual care directly to a patient or their caregiver within the scope of their profession. And again, there's basically three modalities when we think about this type of visit, video, secure messaging, and audio. The telephone is also considered a, a virtual visit. So virtual care services. I'm only gonna to touch briefly on e-consult because it is a service which is only available to primary care providers, so nurse practitioners and family physicians, uh, as well as specialists. So, but I did wanna to touch on it, it is a provincial uh, service that's available. Basically, a primary care provider 
logs into the OTN Hub and uses the eConsult tool to send a question to a specialist, which is then answered in a timely manner. Since August of last year to July, we've done 60,000 e-consults. The average response time is a day. So again, for those of you that work with primary care physicians or with nurse practitioners, you may know the difficulty in sometimes getting a patient seen by a specialist. In this scenario, you can reach out to the specialist and get an answer to your question in a day, which allows you to then manage the care more effectively for these patients. Again, at this time, it's only available to nurse practitioners and primary care providers, but I did want to uh, briefly talk about it. Digi digital self-care was another uh, tool that we talked about. An example of this is Together All. Some of you may know it. It used to be called Big White Wall. They've updated their name, um, I believe in August of this year, to Together All. So it's a free online community for 24 seven mental health support. So there's a community part to it where you can share anonymously and get support from others. There's courses uh, specific to your concerns, uh, depression, anxiety, mood disorders. There's, a, there's a, a plethora of courses available. And there's also resources, free articles, tests, techniques, uh, all available to patients 16 years and up. Uh, it's free in Ontario. Again, it's togetherall.ca. They just have to enter their postal code and then create their account. So this is a quote from one of the users uh, from Together All. Together All gave me a place to feel safe. Everyone was so supportive. It helped me through a difficult time. Um, we're hearing more and more in the news, most recently today and yesterday, about mental health and the impact COVID-19 is having on clients' mental health. So again, whether you're a social worker or a physiotherapist or whatever area you practice in, you're probably noticing some of your clients are having mental health issues. This is a great resource for them. Um, and again, it's available 24 seven and all they need is internet access. So now we're gonna talk about another digital tool which is remote patient monitoring. So our telehome care program has been around for a number of years. It is a program available for patients with CHF and COPD. We'll talk a little bit later in the presentation about how we've expanded the scope of this, but initially it was for CHF and COPD patients. And you can see that it's really a patient-centered model. So the patient is provided with simple technology they use at home. So they get a tablet, a scale, a pulse oximeter, a blood pressure cuff, depending on the condition. They receive self-management and health coaching from a telemedicine nurse. Uh, who also monitors the information they're inputting, as well as providing weekly teaching. The information is also shared with their primary care provider, um, and it really empowers the patient. And what we've seen with the telehome care program is during the interaction, so again, it's a six month intervention, patients have fewer hospitalizations as well as fewer ER visits. But that also continues after the six months once they've stopped being part of the telehome care program. And that in large part is due to the teaching that is offered by the telehome care nurses. So again, this is remote patient monitoring for CHF and COPD. We also have options for surgical patients. Again, a shorter intervention, but it helps them manage their post-op care. And we'll talk a bit about what happened with COVID-19. So now we're gonna get into more virtual visits. So again, we were on that middle box from that first slide that I showed, where we talked about e-consult, remote, uh, remote monitoring, digital self-help. Now we're gonna talk about virtual visits. So virtual visits, the first thing we're gonna talk about is video conferencing. So there's a couple of options to do video conferencing. One is using OTN, so the OTN hub provides video conferencing to all organizations that or healthcare providers that are Ministry of Health funded. So as long as you receive your funding from the Ministry of Health, you can use the OTN hub at no cost. If your funding is not through the Ministry of Health, you can still, re you can still use the OTN hub, but there's costs associated with it. You also have the option of using other technologies. We've all heard of Zoom, we're using WebEx tonight. Um, so there's other technologies out there. What you should know is we do have provincial standards for video conferencing which identify the requirements in order to ensure you're using a safe and secure technology. Um, so those standards are available on our OTN website. And if anybody wants a copy of them, I'm happy to provide them after this meeting. 
Um, but yeah, for anyone using other technologies, you want to make sure that you're meeting the provincial standards. So that's video conferencing. Now, when we talk about video conferencing, there's actually two different types. One is direct to patient, where you're using a secure link or a portal, and the patient connects from their own device, whether it be their computer, their smartphone, their tablet, uh, and they're doing it from the location of their choice, right? They're either doing it from home, from Starbucks if it was open, whatever, wherever they, they can access internet and use their device. The other type of visit is what we call a hosted video visit. These video visits are where patients attend at an approved site with clinical support. So we have over our um, 200 telemedicine nurses across the province whose role is to support patients during, during their virtual visits. So what patients is this ideal for? So obviously more complex patients or patients lacking the technical requirements or the digital literacy for direct to patient. So if your client can't figure out, still has a flip phone, for example, um, then maybe sending them to a patient host site would be a more, uh, a better experience for them to do their virtual visits. Our hosted locations are located at hospitals, family health teams, CHCs. In the Northeast, Northwest, we probably have them in, I would say, most of the communities across both regions. Um, so there's no lack of access for patients if they can't do it from home for whatever reason. And I know there's some concern with sending a patient, right, during COVID-19 to either a hospital or a family health team. Um, we're hearing some anecdotal stories, especially for more complex patients who have been doing their appointments over the phone and then ending up in the eMERGE department because they're not quite understanding and they don't have the support they need during their visits. So again, things to keep in mind, we're gonna talk about it a bit later, is how do you determine what the best modality for your patients? Um, I will point out that for a hosted video visit at this time, it's only available if you're using the OTN network. So if you're using an OTN hub account, um, we do hope in the future that other technologies will be able to connect to our patient host sites. But at this point, it's only available using the OTN network. Um, and these nurses also have tools that may help during the appointments. So they have a patient exam camera. So if you need to look at an incision um, at a joint more closely, they have an exam camera that allows uh, a close-up look at for those types of scenarios. They also have access to a stethoscope if there was a need to listen to heart or lung sounds. Um, I'm missing one. Oh, and they have an ENT scope, which is also available at a lot of our patient host sites. So the other, when we talked about virtual visits, again, remember we talked about video conferencing. I'm not going to talk about audio because I think everyone knows how to use the phone, uh, but I will briefly touch on secure messaging. So again, we have provincial standards for secure messaging solutions. So if you're sourcing a secure messaging solution, there are provincial standards that your solution should meet. So in the OTN Hub, we um, are doing a phase one launch right now of provider to provider secure messaging. Um, we hope to be able to scale that out across the province shortly. And then other solutions will offer you patient to provider, provider to patient back and forth. So what does this look like? So how does this, how does this translate to a practice? So the first example we're gonna talk about, and this was a pilot that was done before COVID, but it's called e-visit primary care. So basically we provided primary care providers, 194 in three Ontario health regions, with access to uh, Novari, or Think Research, we had both solutions, which allowed them to either do a video visit with a patient, to do secure messaging, or um, to do email with patients, okay? Um, patients uh, can indicate, were able to indicate their preferred method, and participating primary care physicians use the pilot funding to appropriately bill for the completed virtual assessments. Um, so again, this was for primary care providers. But also, if they were part of a family health team, um, their allied health uh, clinicians were also able to use the same modality to connect with patients. What was interesting with this pilot is that 90% of the virtual visits were secure messaging. That was patients' preferred modality to connect with their primary care team was using secure messaging. There was some video visits done, uh, but the large majority was actually done um, secure messaging in this instance. 
So let's talk about other examples of specialty care. So these, these again, these are all pre-COVID examples. These are programs that have been using virtual care to provide care to their patients for years. So bariatric program, both in the Northeast and the Northwest, use virtual care video conferencing. Patients often going to uh, doing a hosted visit so that the nurse at the other end can complete vitals, uh, get a weight on the patient and provide that information to the clinician doing the visit. Uh, physiotherapists have done their appointments this way, dietitians, um, et cetera. Diabetes education programs, same thing, Northeast, Northwest, across all the regions have been using video conferencing to see their patients for a number of years. Uh, supportive care oncology, again, the social workers, uh, the dietitians, et cetera, working in the oncology programs have used video conferencing to connect with their patients, again, either hosted or um, direct to patient, connecting with the patient at home. They've also offered their classes using OTN, using video conferencing. Um, so the patient goes, multiple patients go to an OTN site and the clinician from the oncology, from the Northeast Cancer Center or the Northwest Cancer Center provides the education for the patient. Pre-surgery education is another one. So hip and knee patients often have to participate in an education class. This is also offered right now over OTN, uh, but again, any technology that is approved would work. But these are just examples that even before COVID, we were using virtual care to A, reach the patients and to allow patients to do it from their community and not have to travel. COVID impact. So what happened with COVID? Uh, so the first thing is virtual surpassed in-person visits. So in the province right now, there are more virtual visits, be that audio, video, or secure messaging, than there are in-person visits. Um, so as Mike said at the beginning, I have been working in the virtual care space, specifically with OTN for 12 years now. In my 12 years, I don't think we ever got higher than one or 2% of visits. And within a month, we were at over 50. <laughs> um, some of the other things that have happened is virtual emergency departments. Many emergency departments across the province have gone virtual, A, because patients are reluctant to come in, even though they should be, um, as well as to reduce the number of patients sitting in emergency departments. Virtual support groups was another one um, that really ramped up with um, COVID-19. So, Social workers, uh, counselors providing support groups often did these in person and with the pandemic have had to go to virtual. Some of them are using OTN, some are using other technologies, but again, it's trying to figure out how to make the technology work for you. And we'll talk about a little bit about that in just a minute. Uh, the other one I mentioned when we talked about remote monitoring for CHF COPD patients is remote monitoring for COVID symptoms. So this was a pilot that we started I want to say May or June, and we've now scaled out to other organizations. Again, patients that are um, that have COVID symptoms, instead of keeping them in hospital, we're keeping them at home and monitoring them, again, using our Vivify technology. So, and they can use their own device. So they answer a set of questions every day, take their temperature. Uh, some of them may have a pulse oximeter, provide that information, and a nurse is monitoring that information to determine whether or not the patient should come in. Again, it's freeing up beds and keeping patients at home as opposed to keeping them in the hospital. So what we've seen with COVID is really taking the technology and you looking at new models of care to be able to provide care to patients and keep them at home as much as possible. So clinical considerations, things you should be thinking about when you're thinking about virtual care. First of all, is how do you choose between, and I, I made audio and secure messaging equivalent, but an, an audio or a secure message or a direct to patient video or a hosted patient video visit. Um, so again, these are just things to consider. First of all, is the complexity of the patient's condition, the digital literacy of your client, the information that needs to be shared during the visit and the type of exam required. So again, an OT who wants to do a home assessment, probably a direct to patient video would be best. Uh, a physiotherapist who wants to assess a patient's mobility after surgery, maybe a hosted patient video visit would be best, depending on the patient and depending on the complexity. 
So it's really thinking about the type of patient you're seeing, looking at their conditions, and then making the appropriate decision. If you're simply providing results, right, or if it's a counseling session, then maybe audio is, is the best solution. But there's no paintbrush that says, do this for all these types of visits, right? It's using your clinical judgment. Um, what we found with the pandemic is there's been a huge uptake in, in audio, so telephone calls, which may or may not be appropriate, right? There may be situations where if you could lay eyes on your client, would provide more clinical information. So just know that those solutions are always available. Yes, sometimes phone call is easier, but there are times where direct to patient video or even a hosted patient video visit may be uh, a better scenario. So virtual care workflow. So how do you replicate an in-person visit? So the first thing you obviously need to do is review what your current workflow is. Do you share any documents? What type of assessment is required in person? How does your in-person visit happen? And then determine the best virtual option to replicate that. I will say, OTN is here to help. Um, so we have an entire virtual care advisory team whose role is to provide uh, advice on how to implement virtual care into your practice, your organization, or it may be a complex workflow involving multiple organizations when we start talking about uh, hip and knee surgeries, for example. So we are here to help you figure out how to do your workflow. Um, and now I'm going to pass it on to Rebecca for virtual health services. Hi everybody, my name is Rebecca. Um, thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Mike. Um, first, I just wanted to a quick shout out to, I am uh, physically located in on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. I'm physically located very close to Pickwakanagan First Nation in Eastern Ontario. So that's about an hour and a half west of Ottawa. So the primary goal for Indigenous virtual healthcare services is to support the access to care, the how, where, and when it is needed. As with other virtual care access, Indigenous virtual care services connect across the province to the care they need. In addition, support for culturally sensitive care primary, allied health and specialist, as well as traditional elder and healing services. Virtual emergency services is an available program for Northern Remote First Nations, providing access to emergency services in partnerships with Thunder Bay Regional, the Regional Critical Care Response Team, or RCCR, Orange and Indigenous Services Canada. So that's okay, um, the VES program is available within 17 uh, Remote First Nation communities. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. <laughs> um, so some of the the, the uh, access. So out of the 133 First Nation communities in Ontario, 19 communities currently have access to virtual care services. 33% uh, of all the clinical activity for Indigenous organizations and so are supporting remote communities. So most of the work we do for um, clinical access has been supporting remote communities, although during COVID we've had some changes as well, so we will see what the data brings over the next few months. Um, over the years, we've had over 500 consultants support access to care through telemedicine to Indigenous organizations, so that's from specialists to allied healthcare professionals. Since 2015, Indigenous virtual care clinical access has increased by over 140 percent, so the more um, the community does engagement within their own um, communities. They're increasing the access and letting more and more patients know about the availability. Um, Indigenous virtual care encompasses First Nation, Inuit, Métis, and Urban Indigenous. So we, we work with all different types of organizations um, encompassed within those uh, four uh, buckets. Um, some Indigenous organizations provide a hosting site for patients to connect at. Some orgs provide direct to patient services. Most of the primary care organizations utilize OTN for different programs, such as eConsult. Um, 
Consulting orgs and their indigenous navigators support the patient care journey and having access to virtual services is a key to continuation and continuity of service. Partnerships, we have many partnerships with indigenous organizations. Some main ones are with um, the Northern Chiefs Council or KO, um, Métis Nation of Ontario, um, Anishinaabe Health Toronto, Chiefs of Ontario. So those are just some of the partnerships we currently have. So who is connecting? OTAN enabled points of care. So Indigenous sites include Aboriginal Health Access Centres, First Nations Community Nursing Stations and Health Centres, Family Health Teams, Friendship Centres, Indigenous Health Corps organizations. So currently there are over 176 sites. There are 14 organizations that have virtual account access only where they're using their virtual um, OTN hub accounts to connect to patients directly. And we have 43 um, First Nation communities or 43 sites that have the managed service model program, which is a different type of connection where it's facilitated through our partners at KO. So the, the managed service model program was to offer virtual care support access to orgs and communities that had a barrier to funding or access. Um, some of the First Nation communities are not ministry funded, they're federally funded. So in order for them to get connected to the network, there were fees. And in some organizations, that's a barrier to connectivity is another barrier. Um, so for the managed service model, we were able to set up the connection with 43 communities. Some of those sites are within schools, which are great connections because we're able to support um, younger patients to connect to things like OT and um, speech language, et cetera, while they're still in school. It's a lot easier to walk a patient down to the, from the classroom to attend their speech language and then they can go back to class than to try and have a parent take time off work, come and pick up the child, take them to the health center for the the um the video call and then bring them back to school so it's a lot easier it's been this within the school so when we're supporting indigenous patients another key thing that we work with is culturally sensitive care and that means that we have a lot of clinicians that have experience um, in the past as well as continued experience working with indigenous populations so we highlight those and make sure that they're um uh I guess their their information is shared with the site. So if an um, the uh, site is looking for a specialist, they are able to search using that as a search piece. And I believe Brittany will go over our directory um, when she's speaking about uh, for French language services. Next slide, please. This is just a quick slide about how uh, OTN supports virtual care implementation at Indigenous organizations or communities. So we start at the bottom, which is the foundation of the work we do. Um, so you can see the Indigenous organization lead and then myself, the um, Indigenous communities lead with OTN. We work together to support um, community and orgs needs, uh, work, with the work to develop program goals, um, program development, project planning, just like Lynn was saying in her presentation is we work with the teams to recognize how they want to implement the use of virtual care and um, telemedicine within their programs uh, by supporting their pathway to implementation. And then we help with the maintaining and sustaining of the program for ongoing use. Next slide. So this last slide is just a quick one pager of the virtual uh, care services for Indigenous communities. So you can see on the left, the um, quickly I've just listed, there's 109 Indigenous organizations that have OTN access. That includes the, um, all the different types of programs, including First Nation communities, as well as other organizations. Um, 99 of the First Nation communities in Ontario have virtual care access. There are 176 sites. Um, there are 31 mental health and addictions wellness sites that are funded by the ministry through the Chiefs of Ontario. We have 10 Aboriginal health access centers that have OTN access, and there's 18 Métis Nation wellness sites in the province. 
In the center, there's some basic benefits to virtual care. One that's been highlighted recently, of course, is the less exposure to potentially contagious patients. A big one for a lot of uh, Indigenous patients is less travel. Um, so that's important, of course. Um, and then how do patients connect? So there's a little visual up top of the patient in the center, and then there's the hosting or clinical system at the top. The patient can connect using a virtual or managed care system in the middle, and the patient can also connect at home with their own device. We work with um, KO, Chiefs of Ontario, Métis Nation of Ontario, as well as um, virtual care is available in all of the provincial territory organizations in the province. So I think we're going to do questions at the end, if I'm not mistaken. So I will uh, pass the mic on to Brittany. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so I wanted to, uh, you know, take a little bit of time tonight to just go over some of the language barriers uh, in access to healthcare uh, that we see in Ontario, specific to the Francophone community. Um, just like Indigenous care, um, or Indigenous virtual care, sorry, the primary objective of virtual care uh, specific to uh, French language is to support the access um, to care for the Francophone community by addressing some gaps and needs that they see, um, and then implementing virtual care services to address some of those gaps and needs. Um, in Ontario, there are over 600,000 Francophones, um, and that number continues to grow as we welcome uh, newcomers into the country and into the province specifically. Um, and like uh, I think Lynn was mentioning, our main goal is that all Ontarians do have access to healthcare, uh, to the same quality of healthcare. Um, and one way that we can do that for the Francophone population is by implementing some virtual care um, to again, address some of the gaps and needs um, that the population would face. Next slide, please. I always like to start um, my presentations with a couple of examples. Um, all three of these examples were uh, submitted to um, the HQO reports by uh, the French language health planning entities. There are six of them in Ontario. Uh, so this one here is just about healthcare without informed consent. Uh, a young man is at the hospital and his uh, with his interpreter for a leg infection. Later in the day, his medical interpreter leaves and the young man is asked to sign a consent form he believes to be for additional testing. When he woke up from his procedure, he found that his leg had been amputated. He refuses to make a formal complaint as he is traumatized by what has just happened and embarrassed that he misunderstood. Uh, what was what he was signing. He just wanted to go home at that point. Uh, next slide, Lynn. Uh, misdiagnosis. So, um, you know, a 90 year old man with acute hearing loss is admitted after going to the hospital for uh, in extreme pain. Due to his hearing loss, he spoke loudly in French. The care provider didn't understand him and deemed him to be incoherent, delirious and potentially aggressive. Assuming that he was a danger to himself and to others, he was restrained uh, by being tied to his bed. The patient spent most of the day um, tied up with only English speaking staff checking on him. It was finally determined that the issue with the patient was a communication problem due to the fact that he did not speak, uh, he did not speak English or understand English. And then uh, next slide, Lynn. This is just some patient feedback that was received uh, by the entity in the Southwest region. Um, so it's nice, it's reassuring. My family doctor has already offered me workshops uh, of the same kind in English. And I said to myself, how do you want me to go and meditate uh, and learn how to relax when it's not relaxing at all, when you have to try and force yourself to understand what they're going to say, because uh, you understand, because you're not sure if you understand everything 100%. Just receiving the service in French is already more comforting. Uh, the fact that you understand everything they say, it's very appreciated. So these are all examples that show, uh, you know, show the importance um, in accessing healthcare in French for Francophones. Um, when accessing services in your second language, there's a heightened risk of misinterpretation, misdiagnosis, and uh, you know, misunderstanding um, your healthcare and potentially your treatment plan moving forward. Next slide. So these, um, the entities, um, if anybody's ever done the active offer training uh, with the French language health plan entity, planning entities. It's fantastic training, um, but they always use this analogy of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Um, and this, you know, they use this to um, really um, to, to show the importance of, or not the importance, to show, um, to, to identify, um, you know, what, do, what does a patient wait for? Do they wait for uh, a provider to actively offer the service in French, or should they be, um, you know, should they be actively asking for services in French? And it kind of, you know, that, that analogy kind of speaks, speaks to some myths and some facts that we see in Ontario. 
So one myth is that um, a lot of providers and a lot of uh, individuals in Ontario believe that all francophones uh, in Ontario are completely bilingual. Um, and that's not actually true. Um, there are a lot of francophones, especially in Northern Ontario, that don't have bilingual proficiency. Um, there's, this, there's this understanding that there's a lack of French health services um, and there are actually a ton of regional and provincial health care services that are available in French, um, both in person and using virtual services. Um, they believe that there will be longer wait times for services in French. Um, I think this can vary uh, depending on the different regions in Ontario. Um, but uh, by using virtual care, uh, oftentimes the, the wait times are reduced because you can access a service, um, you know, a different provincial service. So, for example, um, in the Sudbury region, if you were looking for mental health services in French, if the wait times were longer um, in that region, you can actually access uh, Hôpital Montfort, uh, Montfort Hospital. Uh, they actually have a virtual mental health program that uh, is a provincial program and available for, um, for patients across the province. Uh, and then the last one, that language is not important when accessing healthcare. Um, I think language is actually, uh, you know, of utmost importance when it comes to healthcare. Uh, individuals are already in a heightened state of stress when they're accessing, you know, healthcare. And uh, how can a patient go about handling treatment, uh, information, diagnoses, medication uh, when, they're, they, when they aren't fully understanding uh, what the provider might be saying to them? Next slide, please. Uh, so just a little bit about virtual care uh, in French language services. So virtual care uh, specific to French language services, it does ad um, it addresses some gaps and needs that are in the province um, specific to accessing services in French. Um, it increases the accessibility to services in French, so just making them more available to the Francophone population. It does break down barriers um, and also addresses wait time, like I had mentioned before. Uh, so you can access provincial programs um, or other programs that are available in your region. It increases the access to specialized services um, for the francophone population. Um, there's an improved patient satisfaction when a patient is receiving uh, healthcare services in their uh, in their preferred language, and uh, it helps to increase the awareness of services available. So, um, what we do is um, we have a, a great partnership, uh, a great collaborative partnership with the six French language health planning entities, and what we do is we work together to. Um, to collaboratively increase the access and the awareness to services that are available. Um, and then we, we share that information with uh, various working groups that we sit on, um, you know, with, uh, with various communities of practice that are, uh, that are currently ongoing in the province, um, just to raise some of the, uh, the awareness of service. Because again, what we're hearing um, is that oftentimes patients uh, that speak French aren't aware of services that are available in French because they don't ask for the service in French. So it's kind of this, again, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do we have to wait for the provider to actively offer service? And I think that's the gold standard, um, but that's not, uh, that, that doesn't necessarily happen all the time. Um, so what we try to do is we try to uh, encourage um, patients to ask and to advocate for themselves to receive services uh, in French. Next slide, please. So uh, just how OTN supports virtual care, um, Rebecca had this in a diagram, so I'm not going to go through everything because it's essentially the same how OTN does support uh, the growth of, of virtual care implementation. So, you know, identifying needs and gaps, uh, working on strategy, planning, development, support, um, working with the organizations on training, workflow, and uh, some other technology, and then maintaining and sustaining the programs. Next slide, please. And uh, as Rebecca was mentioning, um, just about our OTN uh, directory. So there are two, um, there are two culturally uh, appropriate filters on our OTN directory. OTN directory is available to anybody who has an OTN Hub account. Um, so you can see uh, in the red section, so the one on the left, that's the main page of once you've searched in the directory, you can see the two filters. So there's Indigenous filter, uh, and then there's French language services. Um, once you hover over the question marks, there's a little definition that pops up so that if a provider is consenting that they do offer the services, um, they are essentially consenting that they, for example, for French language services, um, what pops up is it says provides comprehensive patient services in French. So this is just ensuring that um, the provider actually provides the whole, uh, you know, the whole patient uh, appointment in French, um, and it's not something, uh, you know, bonjour, comme ça va, it's the, it's the full, uh, the full appointment. And that's available um, both at the provider level and at the organizational level. So you can actually filter it out uh, based on individual provider or uh, at the organization as well. 
think that's the last slide, Lynn. And I think I just made time. Excellent, thank you. So, uh, Mike, are there any questions for us? Well, first of all, Nick Rich, Mercy Bukuf, thank you, all three of you, uh, for a, a great presentation and a, a very timely one as well, given the, the pandemic and how so much uh, more is happening virtually. Uh, if you do have any questions, please do put them into the chat. So I, I think there, there were a couple, um, but I, I'll just uh, start by saying thank you. Uh, again, for providing some, some great information and resources. I, I hadn't heard of Together All before, and that uh, sounds really great. The provincial standards that you had mentioned, if if you could actually provide me with the link uh, or, or the documents, I'll make sure that those get posted uh, with the archive of this webinar for everyone. Yep, no uh, okay, thank you. And uh, certainly those were some powerful examples uh, as well about what can happen when care isn't provided in your preferred language. And I, I know I said this at the beginning, but uh, if people are interested in learning more about Active Offer, we are going to be having a, a webinar just specifically on Active Offer. I believe that one is going to be in January. So I will uh, kind of take the, uh, the lead here with the first question. Um, and I was curious, uh, I, well, first, I was surprised uh, to find that uh, in that one study that you cited that 90% of the communication was kind of through messaging, and that was kind of a preferred method. I was wondering if you had any insight as to, to why that was, uh, whether it had to do with internet access or access to technology generally, whether there were any insights as to why the majority of it was occurring through messaging. Yeah, so the first piece we need to remember is this study was done pre-COVID, right? So patients were still going in for appointments. They still had access to their primary care provider. So they were really using virtual visits to get a prescription renewal to, right? It's not like it is today where for some, for some primary care providers, everything is virtual, right? You only get a phone call. Um, so I believe it was just the ease of use and the type of requests that were happening at that point if we revisited the data today, I would suspect that that percentage would be lower. Um, I would suspect that there were more audio and more video visits happening now. Um, again, this was done pre-COVID, so patients were using it, again, in methods that were convenient for them, knowing that they could still go in and see their physician if it was something they felt they needed to be seen for. That makes sense. Um... So, Haley, I, I, I know there has been some things in the uh, uh, in the chat box. I'm wondering if you could uh, list some of the questions uh, that have been asked. Yes, and there's some that I don't think um, everyone can see in the chat box, so I was thinking I could ask those. Um, so this question uh, may be better directed at Lynn because it was during your part of the presentation. Um, so is there a plan to expand e-consult to rehab professionals? What would the barriers uh, to this be knowing that funding for public practitioners wouldn't be an issue? So uh, expanding e-consult to um, any allied health is a discussion that is ongoing. Uh, e-consult is managed with OTN and the e-consult center of excellence, which is based in Ottawa. So it is a discussion currently happening because we do feel there are scenarios where allied health, be it rehab, be it are actually experts in their field and there would be benefit for primary care providers to be able to ask them questions. The one example that always comes up for me again is bariatric, right? As primary care providers are managing bariatric patients, they may have questions for the bariatric team, which is all allied health. So it is on the table. The discussions are happening. I'm not aware of what the barriers are at this point, uh, but it's certainly on the table being discussed. Thank you, Lynn. Then another question I received uh, says, in some of the remote communities, their cell, severed, cell coverage is better than the internet coverage. Can you explain what the difference is from a technical perspective and what that means to us trying to connect with clients in these communities? It's broadband. <laughs> <laughs> well, how much time do you have? <laughs> so, I mean, 
right now and i just answered a question on on the chat as well as um and the question was are there provincial plans to improve connectivity in the province and and yes there has been i mean in 2015 there was an announcement in north ontario specific to increase the bandwidth and there was lots of money coming from the ministry to support expansion of internet connectivity and then nan and alliance uh Alliance Bell, they did a big project and expanded, but it seems like the expansion happens and capacity goes to the max in almost immediately within certain communities. So there are some communities where the internet is directed to the band office and the health center, and you can go to the health center and there's trucks in the parking lot that are using the Wi-Fi. And then they shut down the Wi-Fi for a couple of hours so they can upload the pay payroll and EMR information, and then they turn it back on because it's not within the whole community. So it depends on the community. Um, some, like you said, have better cell service than broadband. So Every place is different. There's still some communities in Northern Ontario that have um, satellite only. So KNET is doing a lot of work. The ministry right now, there's tables at the ministry and Indigenous Services Canada that are sitting around saying, okay, what do we do? Because the push for healthcare access and education access right now during COVID is so large for um, internet connectivity that it's high on the priority list, but unfortunately, I'm just hearing bits, and so I'm I'm hopeful too that it'll get it'll increase. Um, but when we are working with patients, if if they don't have the connectivity in their homes, then most of the health centers, specifically in Nan Territory in the Northwest, do have uh, clinical systems that they could go to support um, their healthcare needs. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, at this point, that's it for questions, um, unless someone puts one in the chat right now. I, while they are thinking or typing, I, I'll ask one more question. Um, obviously, COVID-19 has gotten everyone thinking more about virtual care and uh, leveraging uh, publicly available technologies that people use uh, socially. And then, of course, we have OTN as well. Is there, are you, do you get a sense if there's any big changes coming down the road in, in uh, what OTN is able to offer that might just be kind of testing, uh, being tested right now? Um, I'm just curious if there there's being any larger changes uh, because of the pandemic and what, what is going to be offered. Um, so I think the big change that we're going to see happening, um, and it started already, is organizations using their own solutions. Um, so if we look at a lot of the hospitals that have gone to Epic, they have built in video conferencing capabilities with Epic. And so a lot of organizations will go to using, and it makes sense, right? It's integrated. Patients have to log into a portal. They have access to other information through that portal. So it makes sense for those organizations to not use the OTN network, but to use um, their own technology. And same with EMRs. EMRs may have uh, built-in video capabilities, and it makes sense for those organizations to use that. So I think that's a huge trend we're going to see moving forward. And with that will come the secure messaging and capabilities, again, with the EMRs, and especially in primary care. Um, so OTN solution will always be available. The one thing we're looking um, to increase awareness of is our patient access network. So again, the fact that there are sites across the province that patients can go to and be supported during their virtual visit if they either don't have the technology or if it's a complex patient that you want that nurse there to ensure that the patient is well supported during the visit, that visit. And the other thing I mentioned briefly is the provider to provider secure messaging. That is something we're working on right now and hoping to scale out across the province just to help with care coordination um and to help with providers that may not have access to secure messaging through their emrs uh, or don't have access when they're not on site and need to share uh, patient health information and will that be available for allied health professionals as well yeah so otm have accounts are available to anyone who's ministry of health funded so allied health secretaries uh, physicians, anyone can have an OTN hub account as long as your organization is Ministry of Health funded, more than 50%.
and within the OTN hub, you will have secure messaging. Again, it's provider to provider, not uh, provider to patient, um, but that should be available hopefully, um, yeah, within a short amount of time. Um, we did just have a, a question come in from Penny Jacob. Uh, Penny's asking, is there any way to do an asynchronous video consult? So I'm trying to understand what that would be. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure what the scenario, uh, Brittany or Rebecca, can you think of where asynchronous video? So the only thing I can think of is, again, with our e-consult platform, you have the ability to record something and upload it sharing videos with families or sending a video for me to see. Um, again, so that would be secure messaging. That would be through uh, provider to patient secure messaging. And that is not something OTN is getting into. That would be through your own uh, either organization. So again, as I mentioned, Epic that a lot of hospitals have gone to, patients have a portal where they can send secure messages back to their consultants. Um, and I'm not sure whether Meditech Expanse, which most of the Northeast is moving to, has that capability as well to have a patient portal and patient upload information. So it would be the secure messaging that would allow you to do that, to uh, have them send videos back and forth. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Penny says thanks. Um, and then one last question. If, if, Haley, was there anything else that came in to you privately? No, there wasn't. No. Okay. I, I'm not sure with your your stats. Um, I, th I think you said uh, this last year it was sixty thousand, almost sixty thousand visits. Is that correct through OTN? Video visits were over a million. Oh, over a million. Sorry, I, I I'm not sure if uh, from the stats uh, whether you kind of look at disciplines in terms of who is is providing care in those and whether you have a sense of how many of those are coming from rehab or dietitians or uh, physician assistants. So you not sure if you, you have that handy or have a general idea. Um, so uh, a, we have a large percentage that is uh, mental health um, as well as some different areas of mental health, but if we exclude some cannabis, some methadone, there's a lot of activity that happens because, again, these are clients that have to be seen often. Um, aside from that, my, and this is just ballpark, my guess is about 50% is physician activity and 50% is allied health. And within that allied health, there's a, many different areas. I want to say rehab is one that's really picked up with COVID. Um, it's an area that most people probably felt had to be done in person, but they figured out how to do it virtually. So rehab is an area that has picked up significantly, um, as well as social work are the two areas that I've seen that have picked up significantly since COVID. That's great. No, thank you. I think, um, sorry, Mike, one of the things we do do, we do track data for all types of therapeutic areas of care. Um, so. We do look at, so like Lynn was saying, mental health, as well as, you know, we break it down. So each of the appointments is broken down into the type of therapeutic care of care it is. Um, we track direct patient where there's a patient on one end of the camera or the other. We track case conferences, we track educational sessions. So um, for this fiscal year so far uh, to the end of September, uh, there's been over almost 3 million direct clinical events that have happened on the OTN network, which is a lot, wow. never had that much. Mm -hmm. So and like Lynn said, over a million of those have been mental health. So about 43, 44% of all of the uh, video visits so far in this fiscal have been mental health. Yep, the pandemic has, has certainly changed things. Um, so I just wanted to clarify something. So if uh, uh, any of our, our clinicians in Northern Ontario aren't at a MOH uh, kind of a supported facility, I, they're still able to access some support through OTN. Right? Is that correct? They can still uh, obtain an OTN hub 
uh, membership. So even if their organization is not Ministry of Health funded, so uh, an allied health individual can purchase a license from OTN for, and again, the category we call them is for-profit healthcare organizations. For $875 a year, they can have an OTN hub account, which allows them to do video conferencing and to connect to patient host sites. If the, if the allied health professional is connecting to an Indigenous community and one that is part of the managed service model program, they do not need an OTN hub account. Um, so if they do have a relationship with an Indigenous community and they, they are supporting that community, then if they could reach out to me, I could get them connected to the uh, regional telemedicine navigator who can then, they do this guest link that connects themselves via video to the First Nation community. So it's a different program than the normal um, OTN programming, but um, specifically over COVID, we've done a lot of connections um, with non-insured health benefits support teams directly to communities during this time because they haven't been able to travel into communities. That's great. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, well, oh, sorry. Yes, I just had just like to ask a question. I am a, I'm an associate professor, in Boston, and what's happened is is that since the pandemic, students are no longer having community learning sessions. Uh, my uh, chat was, has anyone given any thought about providing NASM first and second year students with access to virtual care sessions as a substitute for their community learning sessions? And does the medical school have an OTN uh, account? So the medical school does have an OTN account. Uh, again, because they're Ministry of Education, there are costs associated, so they pay an annual membership fee to OTN. Uh, we've had many uh, residents and students, medical students, uh, sign up for OTN accounts. So that is certainly a possibility that can be discussed for um, the allied health students as well. I'm just trying to figure out how we can get the CLS sessions sort of restarted in a virtual sense because they're they're not the students are having access to community learning sessions. Uh, before the pandemic, they would go out into the community and visit uh, 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 kinesiologists and dentists and physicians, and and they would get that learning experience. And, and I'm just trying to figure out: is there any way we can get the ball rolling to sort of see if we can't get our students back into the into those sessions with uh, physicians and their patients? Um, I'm just so would be trying happy to figure that out. Mike has my contact information. Would be happy to connect you with the appropriate people that you can I can do this. that discussion to troubleshoot what that to start the discussion of what that could look like. Very good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's great. Thank you, William. And uh, again, Mikrich, merci beaucoup. Thank you, Lynn, Rebecca, and Brittany for your your talk today. Really appreciate it. And. Uh, uh, very insightful as well with all of the, the changes uh, that are happening because of the pandemic. So as was mentioned, uh, there will be a, an evaluation and I believe that has already been sent out. So please give us your feedback on this session as well as uh, any suggestions that you have for future sessions. And our, our next session, next webinar will actually be on uh, Remembrance Day. Uh, and that will be looking at uh, Indigenous traditional perspectives on pain management, okay? And the RSVP for that will uh, come out next week. So thank you again. I uh, really appreciate your time tonight, uh, Rebecca, Lynn, and Brittany, and uh, hope everyone has a great evening.